need protection from, um, that you're not destroyed by the blessings that God has given you. And so um, this morning, um, we, we, I've been given such a beautiful theme, and, and maybe let me put a disclaimer uh, before I talk. I, I'm not a guy who likes to preach about judgment and the wrath of God, and here's why. I have no experience with the wrath of God and the, and the judgment of God. If I was to preach about the judgment of God, I'd be lying as a preacher because I would be preaching from, from I'd be preaching about an abstract concept. It would be something that I've never experienced before. I've, I'm yet to experience the anger of God. I'm yet to experience the wrath of God. I'm yet to experience the judgment of God. It is premature to preach a sermon about the judgment of God uh, at the expense of the grace of God, which is something that you have experienced. And so, uh, and so you, you, you'll hardly ever hear me talk about and scaring you, scaring you. And maybe this is why, because my, my relationship with God for, for, a, for a number of years was a bitter one, simply because it was constructed upon a foundation that was orchestrated or that was managed or that was facilitated by fear. I walked into a church once and I found a preacher, and, and I'm, I maybe I'll be revealing my age here, but it was before the days of uh, overhead projectors. And, and this guy had charts, uh, the preacher had charts of beasts, and things and, and when I walked into church that day I was late um, he, had, he had this beast that could not be described and he had ribs in his mouth and the preacher was driving the point home and that's when I, was, I walked in now remember I have got no basis I, you know my, my spiritual senses have not been lubricated by the singing or by the worship I'm coming in just dry from outside and I walk in and this guy says and already I'm feeling guilty because of, the fact that I, because of the fact that I was late to church. And, this, and there's the beast there. And he says, one day the beast shall rise. And those might be your ribs. Man. <laughs> I sat there. I sat there. And the guy was about, I think he was about 15 minutes from finishing his sermon. But the moment he said, he said that, I sat there for 15 minutes waiting for him to make an altar call. I literally prayed for him to make an altar call. Now, when I gave my life to Christ that day, I was not giving my life to Christ. I was saving myself from being eaten by a beast. I was protecting my ribs. That's, that's it. And so for a number of years, and, 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 and I want you to, to follow uh, me closely here. For a number of years, I was, I, was not, I was not in love with God. I was not connected to God. I needed God to protect me from a beast. I, was, I did not run to God because of what he was. I ran to God because of what was chasing me. Now, the problem with that is every time you fall, it becomes difficult. Now, here's the problem. The problem is you don't attach to God because of anything that is intrinsic or you've discovered in God. You attach to him because you fear that letting go might land you in the arms or in the hands of a beast. And so your life, you're, you're miserable in church. And this is how you know you're miserable in church. When you are in church and people are outside, and, and, and I've seen this so many times uh, before, that, you know when, well, in Durban, like people are going to the beach and this is happening a lot in the churches and they drive by in these taxis and they've got like, oh, Munya, and then like, <laughs> they've got these things, they've got their towels. I don't know what they're saying though, but <laughs> so they're, they're like, so they're outside and they're hanging out the windows and they're, and they're swinging their towels and stuff and the taxi drives past the church, right? The church house and you hear zugu, 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 zugu. and the preacher can't preach and this happens just before you stand to preach, right? And these people are driving past and this is how I know the church is full of bitter people. People who are not here because they love God but people who are here because they are afraid of what they become without God. So, so, they, so, so the taxi drives past, right? And the taxi drives and the kids are, are screaming quah, 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 and making a noise and and then one lady or one man will stand up and he'll say, and he'll stand up and he'll say, mm, buzz off. <laughs> buzz off. Do you know, when you are unhappy with your relationship with God, you assume that everyone, oh, let me not, let me not make an assumption. When you're unhappy with your relationship with God, everyone else's happiness outside of where you are becomes offensive. It, you, you, you find yourself bitter, and, and, the, and the reason is because you don't, you're not here because you want to be here. You are here because you are afraid of what will happen to you if you are not here. Now, then you see people who are bold, who are not cowards like you, who dare to step out where you ran away from. And, and, and they dare to live, and they're living their lives. And they're not sad. And by the way, they don't die. You spent the whole day in church trying not to die. They went there where there was death 
and they didn't die. No, no, they're showing you that, that, that grace is not a reward for your obedience. They are showing you that grace finds them in the taxi. Grace protects them in the taxi. Now, God does not protect them because he condones where they are. He protects them long enough to find their way where you are. So, 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 so God keeps them at the beach, drunk as they are. Fornicating, he protects them. Now, I already said before, there's nothing that God hates more than your sin. But there's also nothing that God loves more than you. So God has a dilemma. God has a problem when what he loves the most is immersed in what he hates the most. But time and time and again, this is how we know that God loves more than he hates. This is how we know. He says, for I am God and not man, visiting my anger to the third generation. Ah, but those I love, I preserve their seed to the thousandth generation. Now, somehow the anger of God does not exceed the love of God. Somehow his love seems to be more fit than his anger. And so, and so, and so, and so you are here in church bitter. Because God is a security guard. And you are here, you are bitter. And they are showing you flames out there. They are there smoking and drinking. And that's what offends you. They are doing what you'd like to do. That, that, that's what's killing you. Buy hands, I'll now you funu hands. That's your problem. You're a coward. And so they're doing it and they're, and they're living and they're surviving. And so do you know what we do then? Do you know what we do to placate each other? Do you know what we do? It's not going to last long. You can't continue like that for life. You, they will die. You'll see. We create problems for where they are. And, and, the, and the unfortunate thing is how do you know because you're not there? And so we go to Luke chapter 15. So how do you know? How do you know? And, and, and maybe let me, let, me, let me shoot here prematurely. How do you know, older brother, that your brother wasted his livelihood with halots when you were at home? So how did you... <laughs> when Jesus narrates the story of the lost son, by the way, which is supposed to be the prodigal father, the father is wasteful, not the son. It's, it's the story of the prodigal father, not, not the son. And, 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 and the brother comes back home, and, 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 and the older brother is, is offended by the younger brother returning home. It offends him that he's come back home. Do you know why? Because when he left, he hoped he would die. He's leaving. Yeah. Where is he going? Out there into the world. Oh, does he not know about the beast? That will eat his ribs. No, he, surely he knows. His father told him. And it's a problem. Then, 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 then there's a spiritual dissonance. Because he thought that living apart from the father kills you. And here's this guy who had the guts to do what he couldn't do. And he leaves and comes back and doesn't die. And here's what, what blows my mind. Here's what brings him back. It is not fear. <sighs> what keeps this one is fear of what happens if you leave. What brings this one is what this one should be experiencing when you stay with the father. So what brings him back, the love of the father almost as if it ignores the one who's at home and it travels thousands of miles and finds a son who is in the big star. He is not brought back by fear of rejection. He is brought back by love he once experienced. So when he returns... He's not returning out of fear of being eaten by beasts. He's been with the beasts. He's dined with the beasts. And they have not consumed him. And he realizes, man, I cannot die in the presence of such useless creatures. Let me go back. Let me return. I've tried it. It doesn't work. They promise that they, will, they can't kill me. My father is able to, to protect me in absentia. So for years, he eats with the pigs, consumes food that was not designed for his digestion system, and it doesn't kill him. 
And the brother at home prays that he dies so that my decision to stay will be vindicated. You know, I've said this before. Here's what offends us, and here's why this question is asked. What kind of man is this? By the way, that story of the lost son or the prodigal's father, the lost coin, the lost sheep, is prompted by a question. What kind of man is this that he receives sinners? Right. That's the question. We, we must deal with that question because it's a problematic question, right? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem. By the way, the question says more about the ones who ask it than about the ones about whom it is asked. Right. Now, their challenge is not with the sinners. Their challenge is with the man who receives sinners. Now, so he goes, he comes back, but he's alive. How did he, how did he, how did he survive? How did he, how did he make it? How did he make it? And this is how he made it, because he's a sinner. And the father cannot accept the death of a sinner. Here's why he survives. Because God can't handle the thought of you dying in a pig's die. So, he protects you amongst the pigs. He commands nature to go against itself just so that you can survive. All right. So your, di you begin, you, <laughs> your digestive system is able to handle mud and unclean foods. Bacteria, God cleans it up and sustains you. He says, Lord, why don't you let, why don't you let him go? He, he wonga, he's gone. This guy is, is gone. God says, no, no, not yet. We can't, we can't. You see, because, because, because sin can't have the last word. For where sin abounds, that grace must abound much more. If you must die in your sin, you must die knowing that you died because you rejected grace. You had an option. But you can't die not knowing that you had an option. And, and, and so God protects you and keeps you. And you think you are surviving because you are smart. No, no, it's... Have you ever been... <laughs> okay, I know you're not going to answer this question honestly. So I'm going to ask it rhetorically. Right. And when I ask the question, it doesn't mean that I've done it. <laughs> but have you ever been so drunk that you don't know your name? <laughs> like, like... Like you don't know your name. You wake up the following morning and people say, Hey man, what were you doing last night? I say, last night? I say, yeah... What day is it today? And I said, no, it's Sunday. So last night, what? Well, I will. I mean, I, I came back from church. We went out. We were driving, man. What? And then they pull out a video. <laughs> and they show you. Now, and, and when they show you, they show you, it, that's such a badly constructed sentence, but so they show you you, right? <laughs> they show you a video, and then there you are, and, 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 and you can't identify this person. You don't know who this is. And the only thing that gives you away is your face. <laughs> no, that, that looks like me, right? And so you don't even remember the night. You don't even remember. But the people who are asking you, what were you doing last night, are asking you while you wake up from your bed at home. So the question is, how did you get home? You, you, couldn't, you, you couldn't even remember. How did you get home? You can't remember basic things. Like, how did you, how did you get... You're puking all over the place. You're peeing yourself. But you made it... You somehow found a way to your house. Like, you made it to your bed. How did you get... And, and, and here's, the, here's the kicker. And the guy said, we, we don't know. You just disappeared. We don't know what happened to you. So you could have been anywhere, but you made it home. And it's not because you're smart. And, and some, some of us get up and they say, no, you see me? Even when I'm drunk, I know my way home. No. <laughs> it has absolutely nothing to do with your wisdom or your intelligence. It is because when you, when you, when you, when you abandon the seat of responsibility, God takes over. In your drunkenness. Now, 
And I like Pastor, Mai, Pastor, Pastor Moilwa. He put it so nicely. He talks about a lady who was going to Zimbabwe, and then she had a stomach problem in the bus, and then she had to go to the loo. And she gets to the loo, she drops her wallet in the loo, falls in the loo, and she pulls on the wallet, right? And then she walks out, and she remembers, hey, ah, the wallet is in the loo. Immersed. Inside. It's just, you know, and then, she goes back, she picks it up, and she takes it, ah, oh, man, and she takes it to the, to the sink, and she washes it. She needs it. It's got her passport and her cash. So she stands there. This is my favorite part, right? It's the most disgusting part as well. She stands there, and there's the wallet in her pool. It's her pool. It's her wallet, right? Then she's... Then she says, man, I need this thing. I can't leave it here. All right. So she hates her poo, but she needs her wallet. So, so she, she negotiates. Now her problem, she's decided she's going to take her wallet. She's decided I'm taking it. Her problem is, what am I going to do when I get to the bus? What am I going to do with this mess? She's already decided, right? Then she picks up the wallet, takes it over to the sink, and then she washes it. And this is what she does ne? before she gets to the bus. She takes the wallet and puts it in her inner pocket. Here's why she puts it in the inner pocket, right close to her, to her heart. Because she doesn't want to lose it again. So, so, so she lost it because it was on the peripheries. It was, it was on the outer pocket. So she says, I'm not going to make that mistake again. I'm, I'm putting it here now in my inner pocket. Then, then she, closes the, she, she closes her jacket. Then she goes home and she goes to the bus and sits in the bus. Ah! Then the people say, hmm! It smells in here. She says, hmm! It smells in here. And she sits with her wallet close to her heart. Who do you think? Who do you think suffers from the stench of the wallet more? Is it the people or the one whose heart Harbors the wallet. And she sits with the wallet. And everyone complains. What kind of woman is this? That she walks around smelling like this. Has she not washed? You see, they did not know that what she had was more precious than her, her, her obsession with her reputation. So she no longer cares about what they say. As long as she has her passport. As long as she has her cash. And she's sure she's not going to lose it again. Man! I understand her sacrifice. What I don't understand is God's sacrifice with you. What does he need from you? So what is it? What? <laughs> yeah, guys, come on. Look, I'm preaching right now, right? I'm talking to you right now. There's some of you who are like, ah, this guy's fooling around. Like, I, I'm not even doing this thing properly. That's the only thing I've been placed on this earth to do. And I can't even do it properly. Now, I can't say that God saved me. So that I preach his word. Is that all? Are you telling me that God had to dip his holy divine hand into what he hates the most to save me simply because I can stand here for an hour and make you feel good for your, about yourself? It can't be. He, are you telling me that God would risk his holiness by picking me up and putting me in his inner pocket with all the stench that I have. I know, man, when I walk around and I walk past, people say, even when people don't have something about you, they'll always say, you know, oh, I can't, you can just see him. There's just something not right about him. He's just, even the way, you know, you can't, you can't talk like that and be, and be you just, and I ask myself, I'm, look, I've got no problem with those suspicions. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Have them, have them. But I am in the inner pocket. All right. Now, now here's why I'm on the inner pocket. It is because when I was in the mud, I was sinking. I was scared. And I couldn't see my way back. And so I started rehearsing. I will go back to the Father. And I will negotiate with him. So I'll tell him that I'm sorry that I wasted the gift you gave me. So I need to put in the gift so that he can, so that he won't reject me. So that I'm, I'm showing them I'm bringing something to the table. So I'm sorry for wasting your gift. Um, but you know what? I, I, don't need, I don't even need to be a pastor anymore. 
just, just make sure I'm a regular church member. So, and, and you go back to God and you look for God so that you can present your case before him. And God doesn't seem interested in your story. <laughs> and here's why God must not listen to you when you come to negotiate with him. So that you don't think that your acceptance is a product of your eloquence. So, so your speech must be rejected. Your speech must be rejected. You should not be able to trace the cause of your existence in the presence of God. You should not be able to point to anything that qualifies you for being here. The moment you can point to it, it means you must worship it because that is what keeps you here. Forget the one who keeps you here because of it. Worship the thing that keeps you here. And so, and so the father doesn't listen to the boy's story. He says, the boy says, Father, I'm sorry. He says, hey, bring out a calf. Shut up. Here's a ring. Here's a rope. He says, hey, slaughter a calf there. He says, but dad. He says, no, no, no. This man was lost and now is found. You know what the father is doing? Rejecting the story. So that he no longer... Ex- He's helping the younger man to exist in the father's presence in a state of more peace and calm than his older brother. See, the older man, the old man was not blind to the torture that the older brother had put himself through. He doesn't want this boy to go through it. So, no, no, no. You're not, you're not here because of anything in you. You're here because I choose for you to be here. Gents, it's <laughs> again, it's an example, it's just an illustration I'm making. I, so I must put a disclaimer here. Have you, ever, have you ever spoken to a girl, right? And you thought, Yabolo. Mengfig. I'm just going to throw my khakis. Yabo. That's the first thing. Oh, okay, you don't reveal everything at once. I'm a balak, I keep hanging on. Not here, I build up. So, shangi kolon kal. So I'm figure, first thing I do is I'm gonna hug, I'm gonna hug the Jesus out of her. So that so that she can smell this, right? So you hug her and then and then you wait for the hmm. <laughs> what what's that? You know. Hey, so you so you so you hug and hey. And then so then you, 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 you know, you dress to the nines and she, you can see she's not seeing the sneakers. So can... <laughs> and then you move on, take her to a fancy restaurant or whatever, and going to talk, going to chat. And then as you sit, on, as you sit at the table, then you pull out your coup de gras yeah. and then your car keys. Throw them. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so you just throw them on the table and, and, and there they are. And there the keys. The keys. Now, here's the thing. You've done all of this. You hugged her. She said nothing about the cologne. You have been wiping the white out of your sneakers. She hasn't said anything about the sneakers. Your jeans sit nice. She hasn't said anything. You have been offering to buy her everything in the mall, nothing. You throw the keys, she keeps quiet. She's not even looking at them. In fact, when you threw the keys on the table, she was looking at her phone. And you're thinking, man, she's not sticking to the script. <laughs> By now, she's up. Then at the end of everything, right, you're demotivated, you're discouraged. You're like, you know what? Nothing landed. And then at the end, at the end of, 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 of the meeting, right, you go and she goes, you drop her off and she goes home and then she drops you a text. Says, I had a great time. It would be nice to do it again. <laughs> she, and for the first time it dawns on you that she likes you, not what you have. It's, it's, it's not what you have that she likes. It's, it's you. And, and so you spend the next couple of months trying to discover what it is that she likes about you. And she never tells you. 
all you know is that she's just nuts about you. She's immune to all your armor and your arsenal. She just likes you. It's confusing. It's an uncomfortable space to be in because you'd like to control her feelings and her emotions. But she doesn't like what you're bringing. She simply likes you. And that's what offends us about God. And that's what unsettles us about God. It is that we don't know what he likes about us. And because we don't know what he likes about us, we don't know what we should do more of in order for him to like us more. And so, and so, and, but the fact that we don't know is, 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 is a cause for celebration. If you don't know what it is, it means you can't mess it up. There's no way. There's no way. There's no way you can mess it up. He decides what to like about you. And, and, and he decides that that is what he should love about you more than anything else. Should you be able to put your finger on it, the danger is you might use it to manipulate him. And so he decides, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you what I love about you. I love you because I am love. Now how do you work your way back to someone who, who never stopped loving you? Someone says, thank God that I've been found. I say, no, you have not been found. You have simply woken up to the fact that you have always been loved. And here's the boy. Here's the thing about the boy. The father is at home. The love finds him in the pigsty. The father has not come to fetch him. He's fetched by experiencing the love, memories of the love of the father in the pigsty. So what takes him back home is not the father's threats or the pleading. What takes him back home is waking up to the fact that he was not loved for an inheritance. He was loved simply because the father can't do anything else but love. So he says, I'm getting up and I'm going back to my father. And I like what this boy does. When he gets to the city, he goes and applies for work. He applies. Found a citizen. Good man. To him. No my nicho. Anything, 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 Raz. And the man looks at him. Oh, this, this saddens me. The man looks at him, the citizen. Well, well, by the way, we're not told whether this is a man or a woman. But sizes him up, looks at him. Father of a rich man. Pig owner looks at him. Father went to private school. And the boy who went to private school. Pig owner looks at him. This boy had a trust fund. This boy called his parents by their first names. <laughs> right? This, this, was no, this was no ordinary boy. This was not a boy who went home to ask for something and was told about budgets to wait. No, there, there was no. This is, a, this is a child of allowances. He had allowances. This, this boy. He's royalty. The pig farmer looks at him and he says, with your twang, <laughs> my pigs are going to enjoy having you around. <laughs> no, 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 that, that's sad. The father pours so much effort into developing, growing, leading, manufacturing, piecing the boy together. But the father spent years, sweat, blood, sacrifice in creating someone can look at and sees someone qualified enough to feed their pigs. <clears throat> let, me, let me say this to you. Anyone else you give yourself to wants you to feed something in them. It is only God who sees you as a reservoir into which he can pour himself. Only God who wants you next to him so that he can give you more of himself. That is the only person who wants you so that he can give himself to you. And that's why God creates, by the way, because he can't exist in isolation. He must share himself. So he creates you to share himself with you. So you're not, you're not an act of arrogance. You're not an act. You're not an act. You're not an act, you're not an act of, of, of a God who's trying, to, who's trying to build his ego. You're not an ego initiative. You are, you are you're an act of selflessness. God looks and he says, I can't share this with myself. I must find others to share this with. So he creates you so that you can experience what he is. But 
take yourself away from God and everything you give yourself to only sees you good enough to feed its pigs. It's qualified, is loved, saved, washed by the blood as you are. Everyone else looks at you and they say, my, my, my pigs need some feeding. So, so the boy says, so the boy realizes and remembers the father. Says, okay, I'm, I'm loved unconditionally, so let me just go back home. It's better to be a servant, a slave at home than to be a worker here. So he, he decides he's going to go back home. But here's what he does. He doesn't go back to resign. <laughs> He applied, so he must serve notice. <laughs> but when he leaves, he doesn't go back to resign. He decides, he gets up, and he walks home. You see, the problem is, and this is why you're still stuck where you're stuck, it is because you are still trying to negotiate a peaceful settlement with someone who saw you as a pig feeder. <laughs> you're trying to negotiate your release clause with someone who already relegated you to a pig feeder. And that is why you are, you are where you are. It is because you're trying to negotiate with the devil. He's in the business of imprisoning people in the pig star. You will never win that negotiation. When it's time to go back home, pick your bags, pack your bags, and go to the father. When he calls, ignore the calls. He sends the SMSs and the WhatsApp, block him, mute him, mute her if you must. I'm going back home. I'm not going to negotiate my right to return to my rightful place right next to my father. I'm not going to, I'm not going, I don't, it doesn't need to make sense to you. Our arrangement was not peaceful. It was killing me. So my exit cannot be peaceful. There must, some, a friend of mine likes to use this word, there must be rapture when I revolt against the oppression. I can't revolt against violence peacefully. I must be violent in my revolt. So I must leave you hanging. I must leave you wondering. I must brutalize your ego. When I go back to my father, it must be clear that I found someone who, who, who treats me better than you. Let that eat you up. That I was in your presence. You had an opportunity to do something better with me. You lost it. Now I'm going back. Now I'm going back, and I'm not going to negotiate. You don't deserve it. Oh, you know, but I, uh, you don't deserve the right to negotiate. Why? You lost it the day you relegated me. We can't sit. We can't sit on the same table. By the way, rebe rebelling, revolting in that way puts you in a position of power because now he must negotiate. He must come and negotiate. Say, yay. <laughs> look at how powerful this thing is. Repentance. Look at how powerful repentance is. Look at how powerful repentance is. From the moment you decide to turn back and go, the devil is at your mercy. He must beg you to stay. Look, you have not even been hugged by the father. You're not even home yet. The father has not even taken over. You've just decided I'm going back to the Father. And the... F you know what our problem is, guys? And I know I digress a bit here. You know what our problem is? We think we've, we've got this... Hollywood killed us, you know? We've got this devil who can bend over backwards and crawl walls and speak in a deep voice. That's our understanding of the devil. That thing is powerless, right? He's powerless, that thing. He can't take root in your life without your permission. That's why he must tempt you first. <clears throat> now, the moment you, you heed and you agree to the temptation, then he takes over. But he can't do it without your permission. That is why when you walk away, he can't keep you against your will. So, when you stay, you're not being kept by the devil. You are, you... <laughs> the reason why you're staying is because you have not fetched your right to leave. And, and when you get it, you don't negotiate. You don't tell him, I'm going home. And that's our problem. We, we broadcast things too early, prematurely. Going home. Can she? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going home. So just, no, it, it's, it's not time to negotiate. It's, it's time to go home. You don't negotiate with anyone when you have to go home. When I want to go home, I go home. Like now, if my wife was to call, Say, come home. I don't need to be here for Vespas. 
I'm going home. All right. Why? There's an emergency at home. I have to be at home. My wife has called. I don't need to negotiate with anyone. Maybe SAA. <laughs> but I'm not negotiating with anyone. I'm going home. There's, none of you can keep me against my will. Now it's time to go home. As noble as this is, when it's time to go home, I go home. And I'm just talking about going home to my wife. How much more? When you have to return to God. Let me close it with this. We'll, 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 we'll finish this up at Vespers. Then this boy, um, and this boy gets home, and then the father celebrates and then goes out and, 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 and calls the older brother in. He says, hey, come in. Um, your brother was found, was lost his back, you know. He says, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going back. I'm not going in there. I've been here with you all these years. But you've never, ever, even in no Nileli, just... Just, but this one, who child and ate your money with harlots, as soon as he decides to come back, you throw a party. No, 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 what you, if I was the father, no, 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 what you're not getting is, it's not just his party. You are invited to the party so that you can see, so that you can see what I would do should you decide to leave. So, 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 so come in. See me at my most wasteful with prodigal sons. So that should you choose to be a prodigal one day, you are not afraid to come back simply because you have already seen me in action. So come in. Come in and see. So, 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 so when, when I receive sinners, do not question my intelligence. Do not question, do not question my morality when I hang around with sinners. I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it so that just in case one day you fall, you know you have a father who is with, or you have an advocate who is with the father pleading on your behalf. How do I know how the advocate works? I see him hanging around sinners. So I'm given the privilege. And I love a church that's full of sinners. I love a guy who walks into church smelling of cigarettes. And I say, yes. Even at his weakest, he still remembers the importance of his spiritual well-being. And I say, yes. Look, look. Pastor Papu likes to say this. He likes to say this. He says, I, 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 when a parent shouts and says, no, my child didn't make their bed this morning. They didn't make their bed. He says, no. You are, you are worried about the wrong thing. Celebrate that they woke up on that bed. There are parents who call us to pray for their kids just to come back and mess up a bed. There's a parent who would give their last arm just to have a child who does not make their bed because it is evidence that they woke up there. There's a God out there. There's a God out there. Actually, man, that's too far. There's a God right here who's just happy about you being here. With all the alcohol in your system, God is happy that you're here. He's not worried about what is running in your vein. Now, he's not happy about your presence here because he condones what you have done. He's happy that you are here because he knows he's the only one who can do something about what you have done. And so God says, stay. Stay a little longer. Hey, man, forget the questions. They say more about them than about you. I, I have allowed them to observe us interacting. I've allowed them to see how I treat sinners. As you are here, sinful as you are, you serve as a sermon to the self-righteous of what I can do should they also get lost. Ah, don't leave. Your presence here is important. We need you. We need you. <laughs> the way God treats you shows us that should we also fall into the mess, God will overcome his hatred of what he loves, he hates the most, to save what he loves the most. Someone asks me, how do you know? No, he's, she's here. God did it with her. God did it with him. Why won't he do it for me? I found this. Are we clean? You're wrong. Are we clean? Are we clean? I found this. See, it's now as if you are giving people license to, to sin. And that's what grace is. Grace says, grace, grace says, you stand there with a the threat to waste your life and God's life. And God says, I'm standing here to waste my love on you. And then, and then, and then you, you start wasting and God says, give me your best shot. And, and, and let's see who will win this race. And the more you sin, the more he loves you. 
And the more you run away, the more he chases after you. And the more you reject him, the more he pleads after you. Like a love-stricken teenage boy pleading for love from a girl simply because he thought that being associated with her would elevate his ego. And so God stands there pleading with you to come back home and you reject him thinking that because he needs you. Can't plead so much. Funanik mean. And that's the thing, he wants, he wants nothing from you. He wants to be everything to you. He can't stand the thought of you dying in a pigsty. He can't stand the thought of your perception about life being about feeding people's pigs. He, it drives him nuts. I didn't create her for that. I didn't create him for that. I, Don't leave us. We need you. We get self-righteous at times. We become gatekeepers, qualifiers of who should be here and who shouldn't. And that's precisely why we need you, because we feel like we deserve to be here. We need people who are here simply because they've been qualified to be here, not people who have qualified themselves. Can I share this last thought with you, then we go to lunch? Just young thought, young thought. It's a thought. I saw you. So it's a, th it's a thought. All right. Um, let me share this thought with you. Let me share this thought with you. Um, pointing out how sinful others are does not make you more righteous. <laughs> That's the thought. May God bless you.